Mr. Scorsage? I'd like to follow up on Justice Kagan's question, General. Um, under State Farm, one of the things that uh, the government must normally do is, in its memoranda, explain not just the, the benefits of its proposed co course of action, but also grapple with the costs or negative effects of, of a program that it proposes. And um, your friends on the other side argue that that's another deficiency in the Secretary's memorandum. And I'd like to give you the chance to respond to that. Yes, of course. So I want to say at the outset that my friends are mistaken to suggest that the secretary didn't even consider costs here. The department extensively modeled the costs associated with this program and submitted those cost well, estimates I, to I, OMB. I, 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 I don't just mean the numbers, yeah. um, but generally the, the negative effects um, to the economy, to other persons, to people who don't have this opportunity for debt relief. There are a variety of factors that under State Farm normally the government would have to consider. And, and your friends on the other side argue those are not present in this memorandum. Well, I think that those were, were certainly part and parcel of the Secretary's determination about how to tailor this relief. The Secretary recognized that the central purpose of the HEROES Act was implicated here because there were going to be millions and millions of student loan borrowers who were at serious risk of default and who were in a worse position because of the pandemic. But then he decided to tailor the plan to look at that, the, those particular risks and decide on the scope of relief to offer those borrowers. And of course, the costs associated with that are the flip side of providing HEROES Act relief in any circumstance. There are always going to be the, the cost to the government of offering that benefit to borrowers. Again, not, to, not just the cost to the government. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I, I, what I think they argue that is missing is cost to other persons in terms of fairness, for example, people who've paid their loans, people who um, don't ha ha have planned their lives around not seeking loans, um, and people who are not eligible for loans in the first place, and that a half a trillion dollars is being diverted to one group of favored persons over others. I think that's the nature of their argument, in addition to, as you point out, the cost to the FISC. The, and I didn't see anything in the memorandum that dealt with those kinds of questions. And if there is something, I'd be appreciative if you could point me to it. No, there's not. But that's because I think that those kinds of arguments are inconsistent with the statutory scheme that Congress set up here. Congress already made the judgment that in the context of a national emergency, you should be able to provide borrowers with this kind of relief to serve this purpose. And so I think for, for the states to suggest that it's incumbent on the secretary to say, actually, I'm not going to do that, even though Congress wanted to, me to ensure that borrowers won't be left worse off, is, is just at war with okay. the whole statutory purpose. I appreciate that. Um, Congress has given uh, the executive branch a lot of emergency authority, um, and I, I think your argument rests on that. But it also requires generally uh, the president to specify the provisions of law under which he proposes that he or others will act. Uh, that's 50 U.S.C. 1631, I think. My notes are right. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, did that happen here? Yes, it did. So the COVID-19 emergency, um, the specific provisions that he invoked were part of the Social Security Act and HHS's authority to target the spread of disease. Um, I can't give you the exact citation here, but that determination did, was made. Did he indicate anything under the HEROES Act or the Department of Education that's acting in this case? No, but I think that it's clear that the HEROES Act is linked to the declaration of the national emergency, not the other way around. Okay. And then um, finally, on standing, um, in, in the New York census case, the majority of this court held that the failure to count an individual, potential failure to count an individual, uh, undercount uh, the census, would have potential effects to the state of New York in, the terms, in terms of the benefits it might later receive. That kind of knock-on effect was sufficient to constitute standing in that case. And I'd just like to get your thoughts on how you'd have us distinguish that. Sure. So in that case, of course, the court was looking at a census count that was going to plug in directly to the amount of federal funding that the state would receive. And I think that, you know, in, in the kind of terminology that we've been using and thinking about this issue with, that was a direct effect, that effectively the action would, by virtue of determining federal funding for the state, in that way operate directly on the state or, or at least determine its rights and interests. And here, there's not the same kind of direct effect. Of course, as I've already mentioned to Justice Sutton, 
pled Sotomayor. We think that this is a self-inflicted injury to begin with, so the court doesn't need to get into those issues. But even if it does, here, the kind of downstream effects on tax revenues bring this case within Florida versus Mellon as the closest analog and not Department of Commerce. Thank you.